I call the meeting to order. The school board of Duval County School District is now convened in its regular monthly meeting. To everyone present and to our television viewers, I wish to extend a warm welcome to this meeting of the Duval County School Board. The vision statement of the Duval County School Board states, every student is inspired and prepared for success in college or career and life. The mission statement of the Duval County School Board is to provide educational excellence in every school, in every classroom, for every student, every day. The Duval County School Board is here tonight to listen to reports from district staff and to set policy for the district that will improve student achievement. We will also address budgets, contracts, personnel appointments, and other business items that require a vote of the board. The management and day-to-day -day operations of the district are the responsibility of the superintendent. It is not the role of the board to make managerial or operational decisions. The board has policies and procedures in place to assist the superintendent in resolving management and operational issues. If items appear to move quickly, it is because, because the board meets in an agenda committee meeting prior to the board meeting for an in-depth review of all agenda items. The committee meeting for the June 16, 2020 school board meeting will be held on June the 2nd, 2020 at nine o'clock a.m. and the public is invited to participate. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening and for your interest in the operation of the Duval County School District. Board members, I invite you to stand for a moment of silence and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I can hear myself. We have uh, several presentations. Ms. Vicki Pierre will prevent pre pre begin our presentations for this evening. Ms. Pierre. Good evening. To begin our presentations, uh, we all know that teachers are not the only ones impacting our students, whether that includes secretaries or security guards, it truly takes a team. And that's why this evening, we're gonna begin these presentations by recognizing our 2019-2020 school related employee of the year finalists and winners and even though we must recognize them from a social distance they've each received some special congratulatory packets at their home so we'll begin with our third runner up and that is diane jackson principal's secretary at southside middle school her many roles and responsibilities include coaching multiple sports volunteering as well as chairing the school's very successful United Way campaign. Her principal says she's learned how to be a great employee by simply watching Ms. Jackson in action. And she says Jackson is a role model who will do everything she can to make the lives of every child and adult better. Our next runner up, hopefully we'll see some of their photos soon, is Daryl Johnson. He is the school security guard at Robert E. Lee High School. Johnson is a Marine Corps veteran who wears many hats, including bus coordinator, textbook manager, and coach. But perhaps his most impressive contribution is mentoring young male students on campus who are fathers themselves. And it's all part of what his principal says makes him a dedicated and hardworking person. Our first runner up is Barbara Fimey. She is an ESE prayer professional at Alden Road Exceptional Student Center. She works with students in the school's post-grad transition, transition program, assists with bus duty, and is always willing to help to step in and offer support where needed. And her nominators go on to say she is a highly respected person by her peers, has an infectious sense of humor, and is considered a true asset to the students and community that she serves. 
And finally, this year's School Related Employee of the Year winner is Julia Maneffi, the CRT data entry clerk for Rutledge Pearson Elementary School, where she's worked for nearly two decades. From the gentle way she cares for students to the way she bridges the gap between home and school and the way she adapts to meet age specific or cultural needs, she's known as being warm, humble and compassionate person who goes above and beyond in her service to students, staff and families. She says when she learned of this honor, she was astonished and is truly honored to be the face of Rutledge Pearson's non-instructional personnel. By the way, she is currently part of the district's start program and is working on a bachelor's degree in elementary education with ESOL and reading endorsements. So a very big congratulations to our winner and to the finalists. So we want to move on and recognize a group of teachers who have literally given a lifetime of service to Duval County Public Schools. Each has taught in this school district for at least 40 years as of this school year. And although we must also recognize them from a distance, each of them has received a superintendent's coin of excellence. So we start by recognizing teachers who have been who have been teaching in this district for 40 years. We begin with Linda Blumberg, a speech language pathologist, Eva Clowers, a third grade teacher at Pine Estates Elementary, Carolyn Day, first grade teacher at John Stockton Elementary. Vivian Turner, music teacher at Pinedale Elementary, and Michael Williams, art teacher at Dawn Brewer Elementary. Now the next few teachers, they've been with the district teaching for 41 years. They are Ronald Collins, a CSS teacher at Pinedale Elementary, Mary Crosby, language arts teacher at Terry Parker High School, Mara Donoher, language arts teacher at Stanton College Prep, Susan Lynch, art teacher at Douglas Anderson School of the Arts, Denise Rambach, language arts teacher at Paxson, Deborah Tensley, first grade teacher at Gregory Drive Elementary, and Teresa Woodleaf, an art teacher at Alamakani Elementary. The next three teachers have been teaching with Team Duval for 42 years. They are Crystal Burgos Johnson, a gifted teacher at Fletcher High School, Rosetta Ham, a third grade teacher at Mamie Agnes Jones Elementary, and Paula Messerschmind, a kindergarten teacher at San Pablo Elementary. The next two teachers have taught for 43 years. They're Jacqueline Dillon, mathematics teacher at Terry Parker High School, and Douglas Wright, another mathematics teacher, this time at William M. Raines High School. Now we have one educator who has been teaching in this district for 50 years, and his name is Bobby B.J. Veers, a science teacher at the Marine Science Education Center. And last but not least, a teacher who's been with us for 52 years, and that is Sue Hightower, a varying exceptionalities teacher at Pinedale Elementary School. So we asked these teachers to share some recollections of their time in the district so we could get an idea of how much things have changed over the years. So here are just a few uh, interesting tidbits to share. Um, Ronald Collins, he says when he first began teaching in 1979, his annual salary was $9,400. And he says teachers received a $10,000 salary step after 18 years of service. Denise Rambach, she says that a student's grade change was done with whiteout on handwritten report cards. And she still has the pliers she used to turn on the heater each winter morning in her classroom. She also still has the very first solar powered calculator she bought for 99 cents at a pick and save store. And finally, Mara Denoher says that with her degree, her starting salary was about $7,000. She can remember coming home with purple fingers from manually operating the ditto machine as well as filling out report cards by hand in an unair conditioned facility or faculty lounge with no computers. So clearly a lot has changed during their time, but we congratulate every one of these teachers for their many years of dedication. And that is it for our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Pierre. And that's quite a bit of history. They may not can hear us, let's go ahead and applaud. <laughs> that's amazing. And I, and I know uh, Ty Tower quite well, and she's been a uh, veteran and for those who are not here, not from Jacksonville, Pick and Save, as she mentioned in that article, was, uh, 
I guess, a precursor to Walmart back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So uh, that's that's a lot of history, and we really appreciate all their service. They've been uh, a big asset to this community and continue to be. Uh, Next item is the approval of the May 19th, 2020 agenda that the Duval County School Board approved the May 19th, 2020 agenda as submitted on May the 12th, 2020 with the following changes. Personnel protection equipment purchase item amended. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Board Member Willis, second by uh, uh, Board Member Smith Juarez. Any discussion? I see no hands. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none by your action, we've approved the agenda seven to zero. Next, we have the chairman's report. And uh, I just, first of all, I want to thank uh, Paul Sorez and uh, Dr. Pierce for their work, and of course, Ashley Barr for putting this presentation together for me. I really appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Sparrow, would you uh, bring up the PowerPoint, please? Go back one, please. Thank you. As most of you know, uh, we have talked about how old our schools are, and that discussion has led to the introduction and passage by the City Council of the half-cent referendum for November of this year. But just to go back a little bit and understand that every five years, we are required to review and take an inventory of all our schools. That's considered industry standard, that's best practices as identified by the Council of Great City Schools. So in, 19, in 2016, under the uh, previous superintendent, uh, they commissioned and contracted with Jacobs Engineering, and of course, Dr. Green expanded that to make sure that all our schools were evaluated. And Jacob, Jacobs Engineer underto undertook a review of all our facilities, all the school buildings, not the school act buildings actually used for classrooms in the district in Duval County. And so I just want to kind of go through the history as seen through the windows of the Duval County public school buildings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and as we talk about DCPS facilities, I want to keep in mind that this overview, the timeline dates are based on the original construction year. The official build, building age is based on the average age of square footage. So that means that that takes into account major renovations. It takes into account new building expansions on a campus. And using the official building age, Duval County's public school buildings are one, the oldest of any school district in Florida. Let me repeat that. The oldest of any school district in the state of Florida more than 44 years old. Next slide, please. Here's a historical timeline of all of the DCPS facilities. If you look at those built prior to 1920, prior to the 1920s, West Riverside, Grand Park, and Brentwood had that list. During the 20s, the 1920s, the rowing 20s, as they call it, Maddie V. Rutherford, Arlington Elementary, and Douglas Anderson had that list. If you move over to the 1930s, you notice they only built three new schools, but that was coming out of the Great Depression. Sally, Sadie Tillis, Duncan Fletcher, and Atlantic Beach Elementary were the three. In the 1940s, we increased the number, starting with Maddie V. Rutherford, Alfred I. DuPont, Hogan Spring Glen Elementary. In the 1950s, we're coming out of a war the city is growing, the middle class is growing. Integration becomes a very controversial item. The Brown decision occurred in 1954. 
If you look at the schools listed in the 1950s, 40 of those schools, all 40, of those 40, I'm sorry, eight were built for black students. Of those eight, we're talking about James Weldon Johnson, St. Clair Evans, Richard L. Brown, S.P. Livingston Elementary, Staten, John E. Ford, George Washington Carver, and Northwestern. So there's, there's a clear divide during the 1950s. The next slide, please. 1960s, you have another booming era where we started building more schools, uh, headed by Duncan Fletcher, Hyde Grove, Oak Hill Elementary. 1970s, as things started to change, Palm Avenue for Exceptional Center, Alden Road, and A. Philip Randolph, Frank H. Peterson, and Mayport were all built. The 1980s, we had a number of schools, uh, Crown Point Elementary, Neptune Beach, Greenland Pines, and those areas in Mandarin started to grow. The 1990s, we saw an investment in several new schools, Andrew Robinson, Abbas Park, Chetz Creek. The 2000s, we had Kernan Middle, Ocean Way, Kernan Trail Elementary. And you can see the list of other schools were built during that period of time. Next slide, please. Looking at this historical timeline, you notice that 122 schools were built before centralized air conditioning became common in the 1970s. 136 schools were constructed prior to the launch of the World Wide Web, which occurred in 1990. 157 schools were constructed prior to the Parkland tragedy that occurred in 2018. 10 years, 10 schools, the average, the age of the newest school in Duval County is 10 years old, I'm sorry. Next item. What does all this mean? For reference, our average building was born in 1976. In 1976, the United States of America celebrated its bicentennial. A company called Apple was founded. Punk Rock, Rock was born. Honda launched a new car called the Accord. Gas was, believe it or not, only 59 cents a gallon. Next slide. So what does this mean? The call to action. Almost all of our schools were constructed without contemplating impacts of air quality, technology, and modern school safety. And the referendum is an opportunity to fully adapt our school buildings to this new age, the 21st century. We ask that the viewers stay informed that you follow Duval Schools on Facebook, please visit our referendum website, ourduvalschools.org. Spread the word. Whether you're an industry or a business partner, spread the word. Whether you're a faith-based or influencer partner, spread the word. Support of our parent leaders, spread the word. Regular engagement with stakeholders, spread the word. Facts do matter. Thank you very much, and we ask that you remember to vote for the sales referendum on November the 3rd. That completes my report. Dr. Green, superintendent's report. Thank you, Chairman Jones. If I can have my PowerPoint to come up. You can go to the next slide. Um, today in my report, I'm gonna cover four items. We're gonna talk about school closure. Uh, and when we mean school closure, the closing down of school, ending the school year, summer activities, school reopening plan, and personal protective equipment. Next slide. Just for parents, um, we just, recently got a waiver to approve our school calendar to go back to its original last day for students. So May 27th will be the last day of school for students. June 5th is the last day for teachers. 
uh, during the weeks of May 26th to June 5th, we have designated that time for collection of student materials via bag and tag pickup. Uh, off to the side, you'll see a couple pictures. I went to Spring Park, I hope I got the school right, and we were there touring the school, and when we went into the cafeteria, I said, is this your bag and tag it? And, and she said, yes, and I said, do you mind if I take a picture of it? And so this is what is being done at each of our elementary schools and middle and high schools so that um, our students can pick up their personal items as well as during this time, teachers are closing out their classroom space at each school. Uh, so schools are working with teachers and students, especially um, our priority was fifth grade for elementary, eighth grade for middle school and seniors for high school and any student that we knew uh, was not returning to the school district. Student laptops, as you know, we, we've given out close to 40,000 laptops. We want our students to retain their laptops over the summer. One, it's for those students who will be attending uh, our virtual summer school, as well as um, those students who are um, needing extra support through the summer, I know that many of our teachers, they tutor and they know how to do this virtually through Microsoft Teams. And so our students will have access to technology throughout the summer. The only group we're requesting to return in their laptops are our seniors and students that we know that are not returning um, to school. And I do need to make a correction. Um, our teacher's last day is June. Somehow I put fifth is June 2nd. Next slide. Over the summer, even though through the month of June, we will continue everything through a virtual platform, um, we have not decided about the month of July. Um, we have a number of summer camps. Uh, I know that KHA is also doing virtual summer camps at this time, but there is a belief that, um, that the state may move into phase two, which would be around the July time period, and summer camps may be a part of phase two. And if it is, we want to be prepared to either offer through following the guidelines of offering a summer camp, or if we're not able to offer a summer camp, still able to offer camps or summer school virtually. Uh, as you can see, our summer program, so summer programming, we, we've worked really hard not to eliminate anything that would provide our students additional opportunities for support. So we will have our K-8 intervention program from June 15th through July 24th, uh, our extended school year, uh, it doesn't matter what is offered in July, even if phase two says summer camps can be present on school campuses, extended school year will remain virtual. And it, it will, it's scheduled for July 6th through the 24th. Our ESOL summer maintenance, it's June 15th through July 24th, it virtually supports currently enrolled elementary ESOL students, as well as our secondary ESOL summer maintenance and secondary credit acquisition program. This allows uh, rising ninth grade students needing credit for promotion and 12th grade students needing up to two credits for graduation. That will, that, those programs will run June 15th through the 24th as well. Some are voluntary pre-K programs. This is, this is on hold. Uh, VPK, we really are dictated how we must run VPK from Department of Education. And at this time, they've not given us direction on whether that VPK program will be waived or whether we will still have to do VPK, but we must offer it through virtual means. Currently, VPK, even though we were offering a virtual and hands-on uh, program, they would not count the hours that were all done virtually. We had to ensure we had enough hours for students to be able to participate in hands-on activities. So the summer VPK is, 
is up in the air and until we get information from DOE, uh, we, we can't really move forward with planning for that program. Uh, Fee-based summer camps, as we stated, for the month of June, we're not allowing any camps on campus, but if it is uh, part of the phase two of reopening Florida, we will review to see can we accommodate whatever the guidelines for social distancing and the, the other requirements will, will be uh, put in place by uh, whether it's DOE or through the state task force, we will review that information to see how it would impact our schools. Next slide. School reopening. Um, we've kind of taken a, a phased approach into everything we've done to this point. Um, with the exception of learning, you know, on one day we're going to complete online and three days later we have that program in place. Uh, this, we are given a little bit of time to make some decisions. But I want to share with the board, the reason we were able to turn on a dime to go to home instruction and to have meals delivered or grab and go, those things were able to happen in such a quick time frame because we had a really solid foundation. Uh, I have to give Jim Colbert credit and, and Paula Renfro for the foundation that was set in this district three years ago of purchasing Microsoft Teams, training staff on Microsoft Teams. Uh, at the time, we had 1,400 teachers trained in Microsoft Teams. It may not have been widely used in our schools, but we had everything in place. And so when we found out we needed to go to home instruction, it was very easy to make a decision to do this or not to do that and how to implement. And then we were able to um, add pieces or take away pieces. And it's because we had a solid foundation. And right now, that is what we're trying to do to ensure that whatever school reopening um, looks like, we have the foundational pieces in place so that when this um, massive strategic comprehensive plan is uh, put in motion, we are fully ready to address issues that will come before us. So we have subcommittees developed for every topic. So athletics, we have a subcommittee. Extended day, we have a subcommittee. Uh, general operating, we have a subcommittee. Uh, health issues, we have a subcommittee. Mental health, everything that we feel like, hey, we need to have a solution for this, or we need to ensure that we are prepared logistically to move forward to address uh, the needs of our students and our staff. Every subcommittee, um, uses data to make their decisions. So much of what we're doing on the medical side, we're utilizing guidelines from the CDC and the FDOH, Florida Department of Health. Uh, our Director of Nursing Services sits on that committee. She also sits on the committee that works with the Florida Department of Health to ensure that whatever decision points we need to make, that we are including their expertise in, um, in our plan. In addition, I sit on the mayor's task force for reopening and uh, how I got chose, chosen to be on the medical team, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody saw doctor and just put Dr. Green on that team. But I am on that team with Dr. Haley, who is the director of uh, medicine at the University of Florida Jacksonville and also um, main director at uh, UF Health. And in t we also talk to him. We also get information from that committee to ensure that we're passing everything that we receive onto the subgroups. We just received the national guidance on athletics. It is um, a very extensive document that we are now combing through to see how will that play with the Florida High School Athletics and, and what does this mean for our student athletes for Duval County Public Schools. So we have a number of decision points and all of those decision points are not made at this time. 
But what we have done is making sure here are the instructional considerations that we ha constantly have to keep before us, virtual versus face-to-face. -face. Uh, there are two ways schools can open and schools, um, schools close. As you know, the governor did an executive order and closed all schools. The governor can do an executive order and tell us no schools open until such and such date. We've not received that guidance or information. Um, right now, our calendar says that school will start um, on or about August 10th, and that's what's in place. And so we have to be prepared if that is uh, what we're going to do is open schools August 10th and what open schools look like may be very, uh, very different than it has in the past. Um, assessments of students, we need to figure out with, was there a learning loss through this home instruction and then um, summer, whether they're involved in virtual summer school? Uh, and then class size, will we be able to open with the normal class size for pre-K to three, one to 18, four through eight, one to 22, high school, one to 25? What does that look like? Can, a class, can we actually social distance students with those sizes, class sizes. And we're in the process of uh, looking at classrooms to see how would we reorganize the space in those classrooms. And um, this will not be a one size fits all because as Chairman Jones shared, we have schools from the 1920s all the way to the 2000s and they all have different issues that must be under consideration. So operational considerations, personal protective measures for students and employees, impact on staffing, transportation and technology. And I'll go a little bit more into the personal protective in just a moment. But if we could go to the next slide. This is another data point we use. Every day I go to this website and it's very easy because I get it from the city in the city's up daily update on COVID-19. This slide shows Duval County, and it shows you the um, new cases of residents by day. It shows the age distribution of cases. It tells you, as you can see, male, female, the other demographic information, uh, tells you positive residents, hospitalizations, all of that information is on that slide and we use that information about in making decisions and one of the key points there the medium age for duval is 49 years old um, many of the in the colored chart and i'm pointing as if you all can see my finger touching there but the color chart bar chart shows the age range so you have zero to four five to 14 15 to 24. Uh, thank you nina 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, and as you can see, all the way up to 85 plus. You will see that the bulk of the um, positive residents are in age ranges of either, um, out, more than likely, our employees. If the medium age is 49, that is the number one um, sort of age range from age 25 to 64. And unfortunately, when you see 15 to 24, it doesn't break it down by, it just says 15 to 24, which in that bar graph represents 128 um, individuals. So this information is very important to us because we know that many of our employees fall in these age ranges where the, the, where the numbers are the highest of the total count for Duval County. And that's why we have to be very prescriptive, strategic in looking at a comprehensive plan so that we do everything possible to try to mitigate as many of this, the issues that we possibly can. Next slide, Nina. So that's what leads to personal protective equipment, which it, it's more than um, facial coverings. 
uh, currently there is a national shortage uh, for contactless thermometers. We have been working on this since spring break. Uh, the bulk of our schools do not have one contact contactless thermometer. They have thermometers, but most of them are ones that you drag across the forehead, or there may be even a few that you put up under your arm. Uh, we needed to find how find ways to get more up-to-date thermometers for our schools. So when we started, we found out, oh, there's a national shortage. And we've had to comb through at least 20 different vendors trying to find contactless thermometers. So we've been looking for thermometers, um, whether it's cloth, masks for students and employees, hand sanitizer, gloves. To date, we have spent over $220,000 just on hand sanitizer, cleaning products, and wipes. And that is from spring break to today. And as you know, our students haven't been in our schools, nor has the bulk of our uh, employees been in our schools. So with a minimal staff working in our schools, we are spending around $220,000 over a couple of months to ensure that people have access to um, soap, hand sanitizer, and I forgot, soap is a part of that to ensure that we're doing everything possible to support our employees, as well as the gloves. We have been very fortunate in that um, being with Chartwells, they, they've already purchased, we, I know that we've used over 100,000 gloves to this point since spring break in delivering meals, passing out packets, laptop distribution, uh, we, we go through quite a bit of gloves. We were a little concerned we weren't going to be able to get large gloves. Uh, we all did a yeoman's job searching and searching because we ran out of large and um, we are just, just recently got in a shipment of large gloves. So other comprehensive mitiga mitigation strategies are social distancing, proper hand washing, temperature screenings, using of masks when circulating among others. Uh, the recent CDC uh, guidance talks about um, medical screening for when we decide to open up schools. And so we question, well, what is a medical screening? And it's asking two to three questions and taking a person's temperature. That is one of the recommendations by the CDC if we're going to open up schools. So imagine if even if we did a modified enrollment, that's still a lot that we have to do before a student even comes into the building. Um, if social distancing is still the recommendation of six feet. So yesterday we boarded a 77 passenger school bus. And if anyone would like to unmute their line, I, I would like to give you a chance to guess how many of us were able to sit on that school bus and observe the social distancing of, of six feet. Okay. I'll I won't speak, speak, Dr. Green, because you told me this afternoon. So. <laughs> and I won't either, because you told me the other day, too. <laughs> oh, did I tell them? <laughs> I guess it's 10. 10. You're very close. You're Nine. Close. Nine. That's, that's, we can only transport nine students if we are to follow the current guidance on social distancing. However, there's another piece of that guidance on social distancing is that if you can't do six feet, you should wear facial covering. And that's why we felt the need. We need to ensure that we have that solid foundation of all the resources if we have to implement these uh, guidelines for opening up school. Next slide. So 
we, um, I, I'm, before I congratulate this wonderful assistant principal, uh, Board Member Jones does have a workshop scheduled for us to do more conversation about reopening schools. But we need to just be upfront and transparent. There's still a lot of information we've not received. Um, we are, one, I think just helping our community and everyone to be aware of the magnitude of what it would mean to open our facilities and be in a position where we are giving comfort and um, confidence that we're doing everything possible to keep our students safe and our staff safe. But I'd like to end on a great note um, we are so excited to congratulate Kate Fulginetti, who was announced over the weekend as Florida's 2020 Assistant Principal of the Year. Currently, Ms. Fulginetti is the interim principal of Pinedale Elementary. Um, if I had a crystal ball, I'm, 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 I, I would say that Ms. Fulginetti probably won't be an assistant principal very much longer, but, you know, Right now, she is the interim principal, and we are so proud of her and all the work she has done. Uh, the day that I went out and announced, now that, that was pre-COVID, that she was the, the AP finalist for DCPS, she was so humble and so uh, appreciative and so complimentary, really, of everyone around her how her principal helped her and the teachers help her and the students. And it is, she is just a, a representative of the great employees that we have at every level, level whether it's principal, AP, guidance counselors, uh, deans, our classroom teachers, our paraprofessionals. We're just very proud of Kate and what she represents for DCPS. And Chairman Jones, that is the end of my report. I'm sorry, it was a little lengthy. That's fine. Thank you, Dr. Green. In these times, uh, you have a lot to cover, and we appreciate you keeping us and the public in, informed on what's going on in the district. The next item is public comments. We are now on the public comment portion of our agenda. The school board welcomes your comments on matters that are before the board for consideration. It is not the board's intent to respond this evening, but to use the input in our deliberations. Public comment was accepted by email between 8 o'clock a.m. through 4.30 p.m. Friday, May the 15th, 2020, for the regular board meeting. Thank you for taking your time to address the board. Uh, Dr. Pierce, would you read the comments? Thank you, Chair Jones. We have a number of comments tonight. The first is from Darlene Miller. I'm glad the district is preparing for the next school year in the COVID-19 environment. I do understand that some of the implementation details have not been finalized. I do have some questions and concerns about how this will be implemented. Are students responsible to take home the mask and get it washed? What happens if a child forgets, loses, or damages the mask? Will they get a replacement? How will students and employees receive new filters when required? There are some CDC reports that wearing a mask for long periods of time may be detrimental to your health. How is this being addressed for employees and students wearing a mask for a six hours a day at school? What will the procedure be for students who refuse or cannot, cannot wear the mask for medical, mental health, or sensory related reasons? What about students or employees who rely on lip reading because they have hearing issues? There are many times where parents will be bringing their children to school when they are ill. How will the health of students and employees be protected? Are students going to be sent home if they are ill? What happens if parents refuse to come get their child immediately if they become ill? Signed, Darlene Miller. Next, we hear from Stacy Dern. Ms. Dern writes about masks. Although I agree, we need to do something to make parents and teachers feel secure. I don't think this is the answer. I work at school with over 1,300 students and they are not all well behaved. Every day, someone does something to poke fun or tease another student. Most of this is done in jest. I can see students messing with each other's masks for fun. Kids panicking over masks being messed with. Students forgetting like they do their IDs on a regular basis. 
students ripping them off to be mean because some kids are mean, students refusing to wear them and teachers having no recourse and no place to send them. Team timeout won't work for this if it's a safety issue. Will this be mandatory and then penalized because we have issues with penalties that don't work? If they did, then all problems would have stopped by now. What about lunch? And no, I'm not giving up my lunch or having kids eat in my classroom. What about PE? What about kids with breathing issues? What about arts like band? What about art schools, dancers, musicians, choir? Is there not a better way to spend this relief money than on masks, which give false sense of safety and will eventually create more problems than they will solve? And that's from Stacy Dern. Next, we have comments from Aaron Ribel Clark. Aaron writes, I am writing to you as a teacher concerning the proposed $300,000 to be spent on masks for students. While obviously face coverings are important and recommended by the CDC, I feel that these funds could be better spent. I am concerned about the amount of masks that will be lost or misplaced by students. I feel that we can ask them to provide their own and to those who are unable, we could purchase a much smaller amount to have on hand. I feel funds should be used for the effort in different ways. A list of possible suggestions follow. Cleaning products for classrooms for use by teachers. Increased funds for hand soap, hand sanitizer, facial tissue, hand washing stations and cafeterias. More teachers for reduced class sizes. Funds needed to provide an alternate schedule, a split, split schedule or curriculum that goes virtual more easily than some of what we are using, SRA, et cetera. Funds for additional health monitors at schools to help with temperature taking and social distancing, training for teachers around CDC guidelines, thermometers, tape, paint to help with social distancing, more money for lunch staff to extend hours so there would be fewer students each lunch, money for desks to take the place of long tables, round tables, et cetera. This is not an exhaustive list, but rather a suggestion of what funds could be used for. I urge you to consider other uses of the funds as they are more permanent and sustainable than giving each student their own face mask. Again, Erin Reibel Clark. Our next comment is from Susan Wiley. Uh, she writes about masks very briefly. She says, yes, provide them from Susan Wiley. Rebecca Ionello writes, I just heard that the school board intends for our children to wear masks next year. To expect our children as young as five years old to wear face masks for over seven hours is absurd. Can the so-called leaders just take a step back and breathe, pun intended? Please stop inciting more panic and undue hysteria. What our children need before, what our children need right now is calm, thoughtful leadership. You can do this by not putting out plans and communicate before the issue is necessary. Rebecca Ionella. Allison Messick writes this notes. In regard to opening schools, I do not feel it is safe to reopen schools until the CDC has lifted social distancing guidelines. I realize that many people rely on schools as childcare, but that is not the primary purpose. It should not then be the primary reason for reopening. First priority should be safety. Maslow's hierarchy of needs shows learning will not be effective without safety. If we are required to go back to classrooms with social distancing, we will need to be creative in scheduling. Class sizes are too large, especially in secondary schools. The option of paying a fine to avoid hiring a teacher isn't an option for social distancing. Many classrooms simply cannot fit the number of students and space them out. How will you handle fire and code red drills with social distancing? Schools will need to provide sanitizing wipes, hand sanitizer, soap, paper towels, Kleenex, and other materials to keep germs away. This financial responsibility should not fall on the teachers and parents as it has in the past. As far as school issued face masks, I do agree, agree that if these are required to go to school that they are provided by schools, but who will clean them? Who will ensure they are put on and removed properly? Who will purchase additional filters? What happens when they are lost? We replace IDs constantly. What happens when a student comes to school without the mask? Are they sent home, put in ISSP, as a dress code infraction? What if they decide they don't want to go to math class so the mask is all of a sudden lost? Is this now going to become a disciplinary issue? Are teachers going to spend so much time policing masks and social distancing in addition to other classroom behaviors that no teaching actually happens? If so, when, we, when, if so, then we should be staying home and safe. Our district is unique because of its size and diversity. 
We must consider all socioeconomic groups, all health conditions, all age groups. It is not going to be easy. I agree, we need the time to make the right choices, so I agree to starting after Labor Day. All stakeholders should have an opportunity to have concerns heard and considered in the decision-making process. I am okay with approving the cost of purchasing the face mask, but I think the actual order of them should wait until we have better answers to some of the questions I mentioned above. On another note, I feel that Duval High School students should have the requirement for an online course to graduate, either exempted or be considered met through participation in Duval Homeroom. Obviously not all students participated fully, but most have and it should be recognized. Another option that could be considered is reducing classes from eight to six. The extra two classes could be optional in a virtual school environment. <clears throat> there are more than enough to meet the graduation requirement of 24 credits. My son is on target to have 37 credits. If students and families are not ready to go back to classrooms and, and elect to use Duval Virtual or FLVS, will they be able to retain spots in magnet schools once the danger is over? I do not envy you in having to make these decisions, but please remember to consider everything when you all are going through this process. Thank you again. That was Allison Thompson Messick. Next, we hear from Kim Myers. Uh, Ms. Myers writes, my name is Kim Myers. I currently serve as PTA VP and nominated for PTA president this upcoming 2020-2021 school year at Neptune Beach Elementary. I am a licensed occupational therapist in the state of Florida. I do not approve in any way, shape or form the requiring of masks to be worn at school for this upcoming school year. This is absurd. I do not have a problem if anyone would like to wear mask as an option. And that's from Kim Myers. Next is from Aja Brown. Uh, Ms. Brown writes, to whom it may concern, I just learned of the possible plan for Duval County to spend $300,000 on masks. I will have to strongly consider homeschooling if my children are forced to wear a mask to school and if their teachers are forced to wear masks. Please do not consider this. That's Ms. Aja Brown. Ms. Jody Corwin writes this. Uh, she writes, I cannot imagine my kid especially elementary age, keeping a mask on their face all day long. It just isn't gonna happen. Save the money and use it to give the teachers a raise for all the hard work they're doing. My child will not be wearing a mask. Thank you for your consideration. And that's from Jody Corwin. Ms. Um, April Carney writes this to the Duval County School Board. Is the district really planning to spend $300,000 on PPE masks for students? Do you really think students will wear them? Do you really think elementary age children will keep an itchy, painful to the ears mask on his or her face for eight plus hours or something that isn't even proven to be effective? That money is better spent paying the teachers or improving distance learning for those who aren't willing to send their kids to school without a district branded and required PPE mask. This should be a voluntary option for children who are medically compromised and should be able to provide their own masks approved by DCPS. To spend this amount of our taxpayer money without parent consent is ludicrous. I will pull my children out of the Duval County Public School System. <coughs> Please reconsider how you are spending our hard earned dollars. The teachers who have gone above and beyond the last two months should be receiving these funds. I'm appalled that this is even on the board's docket for approval. And again, that's from April Carney. Kimberly Cronus writes this. I have just read about the school board's proposal to spend $300,000 on PPE for summer and fall. I can't express enough how horrible I think this idea is. How can you expect young kids to wear these uncomfortable masks for eight hours a day? How will they concentrate on learning? What about lunch? What about when they forget them? I will not send my kids back to school if they're expected to wear a mask. Again, that's from Kimberly Cronus. Mariah Cafe writes this. She says, I just saw the proposed PPE purchase for school next year. I'm a parent of a rising seventh grader, fifth grader, and incoming kindergartner. My children are accustomed to wearing masks for the very few outings we have done while on lockdown. We are proud to mask up. However, I do not think this is something we can expect them to wear all day long. As an adult, I am ready to peel mine off after an hour or so. I can't imagine trying to make a room full of five and six-year-olds keep their mask on all day. 
or a middle schooler being picked up because they are wearing a mask while others do not. I would really like to see DP DCPS use these funds instead to improve distance learning. As much as I would love to see my kids return to school, it needs to be done in a way that everyone can handle. If DCPS purchases these masks, I do hope they will consider a shortened school day and or an option to continue distance learning. While I support mask wearing, I do not believe children should be made to wear them all day. Not to mention the amount of masks that will be misplaced, lost, or forgotten. Look at any school lost and find and you'll see. Jackets, lunch boxes, cups, hats, gloves, bags, glasses. Masks can be lost and then what will happen to the rest of the school day? Does the student go home? Does each school have a supply of masks for instances like this? There is a lot to be considered before such a huge purchase is made. Thank you for your time and consideration. And again, that was Mariah Cafe. Jennifer Keller writes, I was reading the agenda on what is being proposed about wearing masks at school. I teach VPK. I do not find this being feasible to teach four-year-olds how to, how to see, how to pronounce letter sounds, and how to visualize how to say them. I don't see them wearing a mask all day either. The age group needs to see and feel how to say letter sounds. This is also a big component to the Nemours Bright Start program. I used to help those who need remediation in letters and letter sounds. They want the teacher to show the students the mouth formations and to use a mirror for them to see how forming letters. They also want you to use your hand near your mouth to show the student how the sounds feel that can be formed, that cannot be formed with your mouth. I was also in my classroom for a few hours cleaning up the room. The room was so hot, I got a huge headache. When I left being so hot and breathing in CO2 all day long from having a mask on. Also, I had gloves on my hands and my, I had gloves on and my hands were so sweaty when I took them off. It was hard to file papers where they needed to go with gloves on. I think they should find other ways to make this work in the classroom without having to wear a mask all day. A mask is to be worn to protect, protect those who do not have a virus so they don't get sick. Not that, not that I am not cautious about this disease, but we are not going to ever be protected 100% because it lives on clothes, body parts, plastic, et cetera. Thank you for your time. And again, that was Jennifer Keller. Jesse Stallnecker writes this, to whom it may concern, uh, as a parent of two children currently enrolled in Duval County Public Schools, I do not support the decision to enforce masks for children as a mandatory policy. This is absolutely insane to think that children should have to live their lives in this way. I feel strongly that mask wearing or not wearing is a choice the parents should be able to make and should not be forced. The health and well being of my child is my choice. I would go even further to say that I think the concept that it actually protects you from the virus is false and it infringes on our constitutional rights as American citizens, fear mongering at its finest. I will not support it. Ms. Dina Vaccaro writes this. I try to say this with all the respect I can because for the most part, I love DCPS. I just wanted to comment on how completely out of touch this proposal makes you look to actual people involved in schools. Some schools struggle to keep hand soap and towels in the bathroom, proper amounts of cleaning supplies to even clean tables between lunches. That money going towards masks that most children will not wear is a brutal and shameful waste of money. Please do not consider this. This also forgets to take into account that many children, like my own, with special needs, who will not be able to follow through with these masks. Thank you for listening. And again, that was Dina Vaccaro. Kelly Haig writes this, I cannot even imagine sending my preschooler, second grader, and fourth grader to school wearing masks. I cannot even breathe when I wear a mask. Please, I beg you not, I beg you do not make the children wear masks. I think having more sanitation areas, uh, such as washing hands and hand sanitizer is totally understandable. I think children learning more outside than being in a classroom for eight hours would be good for them uh, compared to being indoors for so long. And again, that was Kelly Haig. Susan Kuterka writes this. She says this, she says, I strongly urge the school board to reject the pur purchase of personal protection masks for COVID-19 at a cost of up to 
This is a huge waste of money that should be spent on enhancing education, not personal protection. Again, that's Susan Katurka. Aurora Isaley writes this. She says, please reconsider having students and staff wear masks for the school day. This is rife with problems. As an elementary school teacher and Duval County resident and taxpayer, I am very against this decision. It will be difficult to ensure that the children keep the mask on properly, clean the mask properly, and not lose or remove them during the day. Not to mention the problems for those of us who wear glasses. It is very difficult to teach, and it would be impossible for a child to learn to read if their glasses are all fogged up. Additionally, asthmatics will have a real problem breathing in and out through the mask all day. This is not a good situation. You should stop to ask the people with boots on the ground what they feel the most effective maneuver would be in the war against COVID, because they are the ones who will be responsible for carrying out the day-to-day -day operations. Virtual teaching would be, re would be better, and it's not great. Thank you for your time. Keisha Riley writes this. Good afternoon. I am emailing regards to the proposal of students wearing a mandatory mask for the 2020-2021 school year. I would like to express my opinion opposing this. I have one child who has an asthma history and does not breathe well with a mask on his face. The mask works in order to prevent you from spreading the virus. Instead of providing masks for all children, why not provide a test for everyone and you can return to school without a mask if you tested negative? And again, that's Keisha Riley. Jennifer jo John C. writes this. Jennifer writes, to the board, I understand the compliance to the CDC consideration. However, please consider the pure breathing of the psyche and social constraints of the children, as well as teachers, spending their entire days in a mask. Additionally, I know I have a difficult time hearing others when they are speaking through a mask. I can only imagine the difficulty of children trying to learn and master new skills and subjects taught through a mask. Also, the teachers have to try and speak much louder and clearer with every word should not be their prime concern in the classroom. Thank you for your time and consideration. And that's Jennifer Johnson. Michael Napoletano uh, writes this, with all due respect, absolutely, no, absolutely not to face mask. Time for some creative thinking. Face mask are a no, do better. You will scare all the elementary age kids, not to mention how in the world do you expect them to not touch their face? They have little to no self-control. This will only make things worse for them. Stop spreading fear. Uh, Ashley Eichner writes this, my child attends Neptune Beach and I will not allow her to wear a mask while on school grounds. It has been proven that masks other than N95 are not effective against viruses, including COVID-19. And as a small child, she would have a difficult time breathing, learning, and speaking wearing a mask. Masks should not be a requirement to return to school and our fund should support other initiatives that can positively impact academics for our children. <clears throat> Amanda Farrell writes this. Amanda says, hello, I am a parent of two children in public school in Duval County, Jack Speech Elementary. I am writing to support the proposal of funds to cover PPE for students from a COVID fund. I wholeheartedly support such PPE and think it is reasonable and necessary to protect the students, teachers, staff, and family members at home. Although we don't know everything about the virus, we know that it is highly contagious we know that it is spread often through the air and by way of close contact. And we know that people can carry it with few to no symptoms for weeks while spreading it to others. For these reasons, the CDC is recommending masks be worn in public. PPE, including masks, are minor inconveniences to people, which can yield huge positive results to the larger population. Quite simply, why would we not take small steps like PPE if it helps keep more people safe and healthy. I very much want our kids to return to school in an in-person setting. I worry about the damaging effects of them, missing social interaction with friends, teachers, and classmates. If we want to get them back in school, we should have the foresight to do what it takes to get them back safely. For these reasons, I support the $300,000 line item for PPE for schools. And again, that's Amanda Farrell. Next, we hear from Michelle Parker. Ms. Parker writes, as a parent, I do not consent for this proposed agenda that may pass 
for when kids go back to school in the fall. I highly disagree and sincerely hope you do not pass this bill. I have only a minute until time is up to send this email, but have so much more to disagree with regarding all day masks and so much for our children. And again, that's sent in by Michelle Parker. Amanda Napot Napolitano writes this. Amanda writes, I am not in favor of requiring our students to wear face masks as it is not an effective method for, for prevention unless used properly. I have a very hard time using one properly myself and do not believe our kids will able, be able to come close. I say no. Parent of incoming ninth grade and third grade students. And again, that's Amanda Napolitano. Lindsay Morgan writes, this will be a huge no from this family. If anything like this happens in the upcoming school year, we will be homeschooling our two children. Sincerely, again, Lindsay Morgan. Chandra Payan writes this, please consider making the Duval Public School District go back at a later date. If we are made to wear a mask, it will be such a distraction for both sides. Not to mention really difficult for teachers to teach like reading and speech teachers. How safe would we really be because not all children will wear them. The little children don't really understand the importance of wearing one. Well, let's, and let's not get on the subject of how much money this will cost and be wasted. The online classroom seems to be working. We can continue to do this until school campuses are safe to be in. As an employee with my own children at home, I believe if we take a little while longer to be safer at home, it will be the absolute safer choice. Again, that's Chandra Payan. Audrey Roach Slavinsky writes this, please do not spend $300,000 on face mask and PPE for our children to wear at school. Instead, use those funds to enrich the online program. Stagger start times, have two days on campus and three online learning or half day online and half day on campus. So many better options than having our elementary school wear masks for seven hours, which is unrealistic. Let's be more creative as we are, as we are proving to be strong, resilient parents with what we have been through. Work with us to keep our children healthy, not against us. Thank you for your considerations and time and gratitude, Audrey Roach Slavinsky. Sarah Cybers writes this, it is absolutely absurd to request that all students wear masks in the fall. I will have to make a decision to keep my child in public school or take other measures. Stop this. The kids can go back to school and have normal school experience without masks. And again, that's Sarah Cybers. Bridget Oliver writes, I recently saw a social media post with information around the upcoming 2021 school year and the possible recommendations for the COVID safety measures. I do not believe schools should implement requiring students and teachers to wear masks and go through the extra safety measures. I believe teachers will now be spending a majority of their day having to get students to put their masks back on. Additionally, there's no such thing as social distancing when you put kids together. You would be telling kids they cannot play together, hug their teacher, or be able to do group schoolwork, and this could be difficult for many or even harmful mentally to feel rejected by their teachers. If masks are required, I would rather keep my child at home. I hope that does not happen as I feel students need to be in school. I would hope that schools would instead implement adding times to simply go wash their hands or even do a fever check in the morning. Thank you. And again, that's from Bridget Oliver. And then finally from Aisha Franklin, uh, I'm sorry, Aisha Covington on a different topic, Ms. Covington writes, I have three students that attend Highlands Middle. I have a seventh grader in jeopardy of failing because he doesn't have a math teacher. I emailed Dr. Green on Monday. I haven't heard back from her. What provisions are being made for these students? And as an aside, we've reached out to Ms. Franklin to try to get contact information so that we can support her needs. With that, Chair Jones, that concludes our public comment for today. Chairman, you're muted. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Uh, approval of minutes. Does the Duval County School Board approve the minutes from the meetings listed in the agenda item? April 13th, 2020, board workshop. April 13th, 2020, committee meeting. April 27th, 2020, 
regular board meeting. May the 5th, 2020 board workshop. May the 5th, 2020 committee meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by board member Smith Juarez. Is there a second? Okay, second. Second by board member Joyce. Any discussion? Seeing no hands, I call for your vote. Uh, Vice Chair Anderson? Yes. Board member Grimes? Yes. Board member Hershey? Yes. Board member Joyce? Yes. Board member Smith Juarez? Yes. Board member Willie? Yes. Board member Jones, yes. By your action, you've approved the approval of the minutes of, by a vote of seven to zero. Approval of consent agenda. Are there any items to be placed on the consent agenda or items to, for discussion? Okay, I see none. Is there a motion? Board member Willie? Uh, just for, for reference, because we, we don't have it in front of us, can you list out the things that are on for discussion and on for on on for pulled for consent with comment? We have one item for discussion. That's uh, the personal protection equipment purchase. That's the only one for discussion. Did you have, did you have one you want to? No, that's good. I just wanted to make sure I, I knew what was what we were kind of voting okay. on. Thank All you. Right. Move approval. Pardon? Move approval. Okay. Second, Smith Morris. All right. Motion by Vice Chair Anderson, second by Board Member Smith Juarez. Discussion? Seeing none, I call for your vote. Vice Chair Anderson? Yes. Board Member Grimes? Yes. Board Member Hershey? Yes. Board Member Joyce? Yes. Board Member Smith Juarez? Yes. Board Member Willie? Yes. And myself, yes. By action of seven to zero, you have approved uh, this consent agenda. Discussion agenda. Personal protection equipment purchase. Uh, Dr. Green, would you read your recommendation? Yeah. That the Duval County School Board ratify the purchase of personal, excuse me, personal protection equipment from Impulse Souvenirs at a cost not to exceed $340,000. Okay. Uh, discussion, Ms. Board Member Joyce. Thank you, uh, Chair Jones. This item came before the board last week after our workshop, and I pulled it because in my view, it merits public conversation prior to a vote. COVID has presented more challenges than any of us can count. And while I am very appreciative of ideas on how we respond, this item leaves me with many questions concerning the practicality, the policy policing of the wearing of masks at school. First, is it practical? My five kids attended, have attended deep CPS schools. One is a rising sophomore at Baldwin. I was a middle school teacher before I joined this board. My experience with kids and many of, my, of our constituents' children, along with the input I have received from parents and teachers since this item was published, suggest a problem with practicality. For example, Students have a difficult time keeping up with their school IDs. Students forget them and lose them. And I believe masks will be no different. Students will end up wearing other students' masks. Keeping the mask from contamination will be challenging. There is a potential that they could end up a breeding ground for bacteria and viruses. This will be placed on, they will be placed on tables such as cafeteria tables, class tables. Students will drop them. Other students will touch them and they will fidget with their own masks. Um, keeping the masks clean will present a challenge. Um, they will need to be laundered on a regular basis. And I can attest that some of my students, that is some of my previous students that be difficult. 
um, wearing the mask over long periods of time could cause issues with teachers and students. Then there is the practicality problem of conducting class with masks on. I have had several elementary teachers concerned about teaching phonics and performing art classes. On top of these issues is the fact that there are competing positions on the effectiveness of the use of masks. So before this board approves a three hundred thousand dollar, I mean three hundred thousand dollar expense, I think we need more information. We also need more discussion before we incur the cost about how and whether a mask um, should become part of board policy. Are they required? Under what circumstances? For how long? Into the future? What will be the triggers to end the policy? Then concerning policing. How will our administrators and teachers address non-compliance um, and what are the consequences? Again, our teachers, administrators, staff, and families have a lot to be proud of concerning how we've responded to COVID. This item, though, takes a big step too quickly, and I'm afraid that I cannot support it. Okay. Thank you, Board Member Joyce. Uh, Dr. Green, did you want to respond or you want to wait till the other speakers have finished? I think I should wait until okay. other speakers have finished. Okay. Uh, Board Member Hershey. During Dr. Green's presentation, uh, she made the comment that about three years ago, the board decided to purchase teams and because of that vote and that decision, we were prepared for COVID-19. Had the board not been forward thinking, we didn't know obviously that a pandemic was gonna come, uh, but had we not made that decision and had things in place, we would not have been able to respond. That was a decision made three years ago. I feel that our vote tonight isn't so much to answer all the questions that have been raised, um, even by public comment. The, Dr. Green mentioned earlier that there were committees in place, there were discussions taking place, that Chairman Jones has scheduled a workshop for us to have further conversation. The way I see this vote tonight, it's not telling parents and students that you have to wear masks. It's a decision to make a purchase so that we are prepared to open the schools on August 10th. The comment that Dr. Green made during her presentation about transportation is very clear. If you can only get 10 people on a school bus, we cannot afford to do busing. If the option, uh, as she indicated, is students can ride a bus, if they have masks on, then we can provide transportation. I get that there are many unanswered questions, but the decision tonight is to be prepared and to have things in place so that we can protect, protect the health and welfare of our, of our staff, our faculty, and our students. Thank you, uh, board member Smith Juarez. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to first um, just say that I know I have, um, and I have to presume that many of us have um, had conversation with a number of parents and community members and teachers um, and administrators and others over the last several days um, about this issue of personal protective equipment and face coverings. Um, and I wanna say to all of those individuals, um, either who have interacted with me or you know, who have similar concerns to, to many of what um, we have heard tonight for those who are uncomfortable with the masks, um, that, that I, I hear you. 
Um, your, your concerns are valid. They're real. Um, I know for certain that you love your children, that you want what is best for them, um, that you love your jobs, that you want to do the best job that you can for the students who are in your classrooms, and that those concerns come from a place of wanting to be effective. They come from a place of um, wanting your children to have fun while they're at school, to enjoy learning. Um, but I just want to offer um, that while I hear you and while I, I, I acknowledge that those concerns are valid, um, we're, we are in the midst of a pandemic. We don't know what may happen as students return to school. And I think board member Hershey said it well um, that our superintendent staff has been going to incredible lengths to be prepared, um, not just in the immediate term previously, um, but certainly I know over the last several weeks, um, they have been going to incredible lengths to think about all of the innovative ways that we could bring children and staff back into our buildings when it's safe to do so. Um, and, and that being said, we're, we're just having to confront realities that we would not have thought of, um, that, we, that we didn't know that we would be confronting. And we are trying to use the best information that we have, listen to health experts and act in a way um, that does the best good and the least harm. Um, and, and, you know, as I've been a board member, I've had to make a lot of decisions that were in the interest of the best good and the least harm. Um, the, the easiest decisions are the ones that you can say there's, there's all upside. Um, but, but I think here the balance is that we need to move forward with this item. Um, we need to be prepared for what is going to, um, be the, the recommendation of the CDC and health experts when children arrive back at school. We can't say exactly what that is yet, but we know what it is now. Um, you know, I, I've said for years as a board member, and I take very seriously that parents put their children on a bus or, you know, walk to school or, or whatever the case is every day. They're, they're most, most, most precious treasure accomplishment, their children. They, they send them to our schools and they expect them to come home safe and better for having been there. And that is an incredible responsibility. And it is an even greater responsibility in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, and so the, the best that we can do is to prepare for the CDC guidelines, to prepare for what we um, can predict now. There, there are many safety measures that we have in place for the public health that are normalized within our system. And so they, they seem a little bit easier. I understand that this seems like a big shift and a big change right now. Um, but we're fighting against an invisible and invasive enemy and we are working um, to keep your kids and your neighbors and your family safe in the midst of that. Um, I, I will just sort of wrap up by saying that um, our, our children in Duval County Public Schools are amazingly resilient. They have tackled the challenge of virtual learning. Our teachers are incredibly creative and innovative about the ways that they have found to continue to connect with their students virtually. I am certain that they will be amazingly creative and innovative in the way that they adapt to what the new classroom will look like um, as children return. And I, I would just, I would offer that we can position um, the, the issue of masks, the issue of face coverings as something that is an opportunity, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be something that um, is laden in fear. 
It is the opportunity for each of our children, for all of our staff to be helpers. It is the opportunity for children, for staff, for anyone who comes into a building um, to be their brother and sister's keeper. The wearing of a mask is not just to protect the person who's wearing it. It's about being a global citizen in a pandemic and protecting others as well. And so as we each put on our masks as we go out, we have the opportunity to be helpers, to be heroes in something that is unpredictable. And I would ask that we all come together, that we think about the opportunity that we have and the tools that are in our toolbox right now to think about how to prepare and that we phrase this as a positive because it can be. It's, it's not a mislabel, it's not a, a spin on things, it is the opportunity to be helpers in a pandemic. It is the opportunity to be safer in our buildings and in our schools. Um, and, and I have seen over the last eight weeks the incredible work that has happened to keep learning lively, to keep children engaged, to navigate this new world order that is happening. And I know that the same thing will happen in the fall, no matter what the situation may be. I would want to ask the, the superintendent to just address um, a, a couple of things um, that, that she and I had some extended conversation about um, and, and that overlap a, a little bit um, with some of board member Joyce's questions. Um, so uh, Dr. Green, can, could you um, maybe just summarize the, the item itself um, and, and staff's current thinking as to personal protective equipment? Um, as it relates to the facial coverings, the, when we look at currently what we are using for facial coverings, we have pretty much depleted our cl uh, clinic mask. We, we've utilized uh, pretty much all of that as well as mm, the cloth mask that the Chamber of Commerce donated to the school district. So in, since spring break, we have used over 10,000, whether disposable or cloth, facial coverings. Uh, and that is, as I stated, with us at a minimal staff. When we move back to full, in, whether it's full employment with everyone at the main building, Team B, and our schools open, what, whatever open looks like, we felt that we need to make sure that if the guidelines still require us to have some type of facial covering. We want to ensure equity across the district. We have some schools where that is not a problem for parents. They will provide facial to other schools. They may be providing um, the simplistic facial covering that might not um, actually be one that is sturdy. Uh, we don't want to go back into dealing we already deal enough with bullying um, and and there was the thing about wearing the bandanas that ties to other issues and so the goal was hey these these masks even if we're giving them to the students they have one mask if they're a bus rider and if we have to try to transport even if we're just doing one per seat that still does not meet the CDC guidelines. As I shared, only nine students fit on the bus by following that. And I didn't share on an ESC bus, it's two and three wheelchairs. And those three wheelchairs depend on the size of the wheelchair. So there, there's no way we can transport students. Even if that's all we used it for was to sure, ensure that bus riders had something that the district is if we're saying this is for your safety, it is of 
not just my opinion, but of the opinion that we would hold more liability if we didn't provide you anything. And something, uh, if someone was all of a sudden diagnosed with COVID, they would have the claim, you didn't do everything possible to prevent this. And so that is why we want to be prepared. At this point, we have, there's been nothing laid out that says, oh, you must wear mask all day long. There's nothing been laid out that says um, anything. But if, if we don't even have it available, then we're behind the eight ball. And as we said, we are fighting national shortages. Um, we have been help, tried to be helpful to the medical community because they are the ones who want the it. We have not bought any N95s because they've asked only medical. The N95s that we have are for our painters and we are buying N95s for our clinics so that if a student is exposing symptoms, we can convert, give, give that student an N95 and determine where they will be until we can get a parent um, notified to pick them up. We're going to encounter many challenges. Yes, I, they're going to send their children to school. And it, at the beginning of the day, they don't have a fever. But come lunchtime, they do. And it's going to be hard to reach a parent. But we better be prepared to isolate that student and give that student every opportunity to be protected and the people who have to serve that student. So this is about being prepared. And even if it's optional, our employees are different than students. Our employees, if we're saying that even if it's optional, but we feel we highly suggested, um, there would probably be an expectation that we are going to at least provide you the initial um, support to do your job and do it in a way that you are, um, you feel that the school district is doing everything possible to uh, mitigate any circumstances. And I do want to say, yes, this purchase is $300,000. When we look at hand sanitizer, that's probably going to be three times the cost. If, to put hand sanitizer in every hallway, on every practice field, every, every location is going to be the real cost. That is really where we're going to invest uh, much of the dollars that we receive from the CARES Act or PPE. Uh, a lot of it's going to be spent on the hand washing, the signage, the, 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 the things we're going to put on the floor to help students with six feet apart. The, the mask is just an initial, we are prepared. We, we have enough time to try to locate the um, disposable ones so that our clinics are replenished and, and the issue with thermometers. So right now they're saying that we would have to medically screen everyone before they, before they come to school. I've gave you probably more information than you than you asked for. No, I, I I appreciate it, and nobody wants to be in this position. Nobody wants to be making these decisions. Um, but I appreciate and applaud your leadership um, and the preparation that you and your staff have been thoughtful to uh, plan for how we can be prepared. Um, you, at the only other thing that you alluded to, but I just want to be clear on with this item, were we to defer the item or not vote on it today, would we risk not having the um, deliverable, the, the face coverings for um, the opening of schools when that happens? So far, everything that we have ordered related to PPE has not come in when they said it would. We, again, have been waiting weeks on thermometers. Our concern is if we don't move forward with it, it's going to be delayed even in the best of situations. And we don't want to uh, not be prepared if we're opening up on August 10th and, and have at least the initial uh, supplies. So that is the purpose of 
trying to be prepared prior to main the main decisions made for opening. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I don't see any other hands. I just want to add that I'll come back that as a district, we've been a leader. Uh, I think we've shown that we've demonstrated that leadership over a number of years by being prepared to quickly transition uh, to all own room. Um, and as board member members have said, there are a lot of parents who are anxious for students to return to the classroom to face the teacher. I think that's important. We keep in mind that there are parents who, as things improve, would have to go back to work. Uh, and sure, school is not supposed to be a daycare, but in reality, it is. It is a place, a safe place for students to learn and to engage with one another. Uh, we, I'm also concerned about the learning loss that some of our students are, are experiencing during this pandemic where they may not have the structure at home to engage every day in the classroom in Duval homeroom. Uh, that's a major concern of mine, especially in, turn, in our turnaround school, which I have probably more than anyone else. Uh, thirdly, as a former Boy Scout, I always was taught to be prepared. If we don't make this pur purchase, we cannot be prepared if the CDC uh, requirements are not changed. How can we pre be prepared? And the, the purchase does not include just face masks. We, we're also including the hand sanitizers, the, the thermometers, as Dr. Green pointed out, signage, which I uh, really forgot about. So it's a very comprehensive uh, purchase to make sure that we are prepared and that we, that we remain a leader in being prepared for whatever is to come uh, at, during the next school year. So I just want to commend the staff and Dr. Green for bringing this to us because we uh, have been recognized as one of the leaders and, and, and these are difficult times. And I just uh, hope that we can continue to uh, be flexible and make the changes that's necessary to make sure that our students are prepared and ready to re-engage with uh, our teachers once school reopens. Uh, Board Member Joyce. Uh, yeah, first I'd like to just clarify the financial impact um, for the item suggested that that $300,000 plus item was just face masks. And I just want to, through the chair, to the superintendent to make sure that we are clear that that does not include hand sanitizer or any other items that would be related to COVID. That is correct. Uh, through the chair to Ms. Joyce, that is correct. This item is only for facial covering mask. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I just want to just also go back to the practicality. Um, I know that we've talked about bus situations and kids getting on buses and they can't um, social distance. So, uh, you know, it'd be, it would be beneficial for children to have the mask while they're riding the buses. But, um, you know, Again, as a parent and as a teacher, I just want to, you know, say this so it's on record that there are not bus monitors on most of these buses. And the bus driver cannot police the students wearing the face mask on the bus. And so, you know, it might look good as on paper, but actually, will it happen? It won't. Students are just not going to wear them unless the teacher is standing over them, making them or a bus monitor. And so I just want to be realistic and practical about this. Um, it is a large amount of money, and I believe that we need to have more conversation um, about this. What is the policy? What? How are we going to police it? And it's really the the item suggests that it's one per student and one per employee and again the students will lose them once they lose them what are we going to do or do we have 
is the district going to come back to the board and say we are we need another three or four hundred thousand dollars to buy additional masks um these are just questions that i believe that the the taxpayers need answers to before we approve this expenditure okay thank you board member willie uh thank you uh chairman i i I, um, this is an interesting conversation because um, uh, I'm in a, in a boat where I have a kid and, and I know that I've talked to, to folks and folks have called me on, on both sides of it. And there are some folks who that have said, I mean, one of the biggest statements that I hear is if, if we are required to go back to school and have face masks, we need to be the ones that are providing such face masks. Um, and I think that's a, a, the ultimate statement of if, and we don't know if anything is going to happen, but I think we have to be prepared um, for whatever does happen. And I think if we if we are not prepared, then we put ourselves behind the eight ball. I do have a couple of questions to clarify because there was a number of statements uh, made and I want to make sure, first of all, the number of masks that we're purchasing, I would love to know that. And then is there's no, and what is the policy? People keep talking about we're going to have to wear masks, but there has not been any policy change or anything along those lines that has said that. So I want to make sure that it's clarified that we have not made any decision on folks having to wear masks. We are doing this in in sort of foresight to understand. So I want to get that. And, um, and then also, and this may be a, another question, you talked about the CARES Act and some of the money and what it can be spent on, but I heard some comments too about we should spend in different places, but I'm sure there's some restrictions there. So I don't know if we have that information, that may be a different conversation. But first is the number of masks, and then two is like the, the policy piece that people are mentioning. And that's to the superintendent. Through the chair to board member Willie, uh, I don't exactly have it in front of me, but um, I believe that it is close to 200,000 masks that would be um, ensuring that every, if we were doing every employee, every employee would have one mask and that it, every student plus additional masks, whether it is related to transportation, athletics, all these different situations that we have to uh, determine how do we fulfill what the CDC is is saying we should do and and that was the purpose your second question is no we do not have a policy but we have a procedure for closing down schools and that procedure does require teachers to come in with the facial covering they cannot come and it requires them to have their temperature taken and then once they get to their room they're allowed to take it off because they're in there by themselves but anytime they are moving on that campus they are required to have a facial covering right now um, in this building we do we currently are not requiring it because there's not we can social distance ourselves there's not that many people in the building but when we go to more people being in the building, our goal is that the way we're set up on each of the um, floors, we've, we've done an analysis of, of every floor, floor Paul's Soros group uh, has been walking each floor to ensure, hey, we don't really want them wearing masks when they're sitting at their desks because we think we can social distance them enough that they don't need to wear a mask. What we can't social distance very well is when you get into that elevator, we're now saying we're going to put the triangle. So only three people can get in the elevator. And I assure you, even three people in that elevator, you're not six feet apart. You're not in a social distance um, environment where we're not able to. And so the guideline says when you're not able to do that, you should wear or someone should wear a facial covering. And that is what we are trying to put in procedures to say, when you're at your work, when I'm at my desk, I should not be concerned about trying to wear a mask. But if the guideline says nine people can be in my office and if I can't 
you know, I really wouldn't have nine people in my office. I would say, let's, let's have a go-to meeting. But if it happened, I would say, we need to figure out how we can be socially distanced by six feet. If not, then you're gonna have to come with, with, your, with your facial covering. So we do not have a policy. Right now, it is just written in the procedures of closing down school and ensuring that when people come on the campus that, that we're, we're making sure that they are safe. And really what I'm getting more from teachers is those that are making decisions whether they're gonna retire because we're telling them they have to come back to work. Because they don't, they don't know that they will feel safe at work. Did I, did I, and, um, and I, was, I, I'm sorry, I need to correct the number. Um, it's 143,000 masks and I said close to 200, but that was not correct. And then are there any restrictions on those, on these CARES dollars and if they come with restrictions? I think that was his third question. The current um, guidance we received about the CARES dollars is that there are certain things that they feel should be priority, uh, but we've not been given anything that says you must do this, this, and this. And PPE is one of the, the, the items that, that's um, allowable under the CARES Act so far. That answers the question, Board Member Willie. That did, thank you. I do have one, one more, I guess a follow-up is probably a simple question because I also will have all these masks. If we don't use them, I think when you think about taxpayer dollars, they could go to waste, but I don't believe that these masks will expire, correct? So we could use them in other sort of avenues or places that we need to in years to come if we don't have to use them. Well, to answer your question, Board Member Willie, through the chair to Board Member Willie, Remember I said our clinics have pretty much decimated. So there's always going to be a need for masks. It's not like we still won't have an opportunity to use, utilize them um, as support, but no, they're not going to, they're not going to go to waste if that's what you, your question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I apologize to Vice Chair Anderson. Uh, I did, I don't see you here, I had to look up there, but Go ahead, Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you so much, um, Chair Jones. So I have um, several questions. I sent some over to the superintendent um, and several of which you've been able to answer tonight in, in the conversation that we've had, and I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the communications that you were able to send out to our families um, yesterday, as well as the survey that I think is really important for families to complete um, and to be able to provide their feedback and, and be a part of this process. Um, and for me, I think that this particular item not being part of our, our workshop um, last week and coming late in the week has been um, unfortunate, right? Because I think that this is where our community members are letting their, their imaginations kind of run wild and the news has picked up on it. And so there's all this speculation going on about what is this crazy school board doing? Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation tonight. For me, I think that the public and my constituency um, have, you heard several of my constituents in public comment. Um, I've, I've gotten a lot of emails. I don't know if you all have um, several phone calls. And so I want, I want to be able for them to hear some of the questions and some of the conversation that would normally go into a discussion um, around an agenda item and workshop. So, uh, when I'm looking at the item, there's a couple things that stand out to me that I'd like some clarification on from Dr. Green. Um, in the recommendation, I noticed that it, the, the word approved is stricken and um, it's replaced with the word ratify. So I have a question about that and what is the, um, to learn more about what that intentional um, switch is. And then down in the financial excuse me, in the, yeah, in the financial impact, we're looking at um, fund 10740. And so if you could tell me more about this fund category, fund category that um, is specifically for COVID-19 costs, I'll start there if you don't mind. 
Um, the policy talks about that in an emergency, we are able to make purchases because right now uh, related to COVID-19. This purchase is related to COVID-19. And at the time we weren't able to get any additional facial coverings, whether we call them masks or disposable. And the N95 was costing uh, almost the same amount as the current cloth facial coverings. So we followed our procedure with our purchasing department purchasing department indicated that we we equal, we can make the purchase, but that we needed to bring it before the board that this is a purchase we have made. And that is why you see ratified. And so, so we, just to be clear, this has already been purchased. The order, the, the order has been put in, yes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to be, you know, clear on that agenda item. Um, and then the fund that we're using, it, that category, that fund category, can you tell me more about that? Yeah. Through the chair to board member Anderson, I'm gonna ask Michelle vaguely because finance has set up a fund so that we can track all of our COVID-19 purchases. So that when we receive the dollars, we can reimburse the district and we're not searching or fumbling, looking for well, what, what did we spend uh, dollars for for COVID-19? But I'll let Ms. Bigley add any clarifying information that needs to be added. Okay. Through the chair to board member Anderson, um, Dr. Green is correct. Uh, we realized that we would need to keep track of all of our purchases that related to PPE and those types of things. So in order to make it easier to track, we just established fund 10740 as part of the general fund. And so um, that's the fund we've established for that. So, so we'll, we'll be transferring, we'll be moving dollars. We'll see it come out of a separate line item, but it's coming from the general fund. Well, it's still within the general fund. So when you look at the, um, budget amendments going forward right uh, you may not notice that but it is still part of the general fund because we're using general fund dollars so this is not related to any funding that we have received from any stimulus from either the state or the federal government related to the cares act it's just for our mm -hmm. track this is for our tracking purposes um through the chair to board member anderson this is for our tracking purposes so going forward should we be able to request reimbursement from any stimulus funds we would be able to pull it out of our records pretty easily sure thank you um along those same lines why would this item this purchasing or, or in this case a ratifying of the purchase um, come to the board when large purchases are made for sanitizer thermometers um, hand soap, cleaning supplies, all of those things, like you alluded to earlier, sanitizer will probably cost three times the amount that these masks cost. So I'm just curious about why this has come as a separate agenda item. Well, through the board chair to uh, vice chair Anderson, it is coming because this is unique. And um, I think upfront transparency is so much better than I mean, I, I actually disagreed with the purchasing department, said, you know, this is a commodity. Why are we having to do this? And it, because these, we've never used cloth masks, even though we order disposable masks all the time, but they are used more for our clinics uh, than large scale purchases such as this. And so the purchasing department uh, felt it fell under that guideline that this was not a normal purchase, like hand sanitizer is normal for us. Not this volume of hand sanitizer, but it is a normal purchase and therefore um, did not need to go before the board as an agenda item. And so that's why you see this one, but you don't see hand sanitizer, you don't see anything about what, the wipes that we're purchasing. You, you don't see anything about thermometers because we do purchase thermometers for our clinics, but the current 
thermometers that we have are not contactless. And if we're having to do large volume of temperature checks, we need more than what we have now. I, I appreciate the clarification because for me, I mean, there are supplies that are purchased all the time as part of our daily operation that facilitate, you know, basic safety, health and hygiene for our schools. Um, and I think it's important for the community to understand that this is one of those items that what it sounds like I'm hearing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that this is a uh, supply, right? That this is one of those things that we want to have in the closet, have on hand and be ready to use as needed. Um, from a practical logistical standpoint, I think my community and my constituency is concerned about, um, you know, how they'll be used. Is this something, I mean, we saw, we heard in, in all the public comments, not all, but most of them, um, most of the emails that I received, the phone calls that I received, the social media rants that I've read, has really been around the word mandatory. And so I think that it's really important that not only we reiterate again, <laughs> what your intention is for the mask um, as it relates to whether or not they are mandatory or if this is just a simple um, commodity supply thing that is gonna go on the list of all the rest of the supplies that you think are important to have on hand. Um, but I also think that the next part of the question will be when decisions have to be made around how they'll be used, if, if your intention for them um, changes, how will the community know that as well? To the chair, to board member Anderson, uh, I think it, it starts with next week's workshop, uh, which next week's workshop will not give you a whole lot of answers either because we just received the CDC, new CDC guidelines last week. Um, we believe those guidelines are gonna change because again, we can't transport students based on those guidelines. You have to give us something else. Um, right now, high school football is supposed to start on July 27th. We do not have guidance on, okay, what does that look like for us? Or what does that look like for anybody? Um, or, or should you consider pushing the season back? So what we're sharing next week is really um, informing the board, here are all these decision points that we have to make. And there are some that we can make rel relatively quickly, and then there are others. We can't make that decision until July. And I think um, the way we've been communicating with our families through our connected, through uh, the survey, which as of today, we've had over 12,000 individuals answer our survey. So obviously when we send it out there, somebody, they're reading our information. Uh, and um, the amazing thing is um, the students all want to come back to school. <laughs> Everybody. 100%, we want to come back to school. And uh, comfortable, you know, that's their comfort level. Uh, and parents have, you know, it's interesting that the different points of view that we're receiving. So it really will be a, 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 a long process throughout the summer, but I wanna go back to something I said earlier and Ms. Hershey reiterated. This is about being prepared so that when we get that last moment bit of information that says, oh, you need to do, we can turn on a dime and do it and be, be ready to move forward. Um, so although this, this is considered a supply, it is a supply that we've not really purchased in the past. And therefore that is why we brought it forward to the board. No, I think that this is one of those strange things. And I'm, I'm really curious to think about a number of different policies in the governance part of, of something like this, um, because attendance policies, sick leave policies. I and mean, there's a lot of things that I think we need to take a look at to make sure that we are creating an environment that is conducive to staff and students and families being healthy and well. Um, and this is not one of those that would be an exception. So for me, I'd really like for us to consider, and perhaps I can get with Ms. Chastain to take a look at, 
what um, what would need to happen or what would be the process for rolling out some sort of procedure and whether or not that needs to be something that's more formal. It's odd because this is a pandemic and I hope that this isn't something that we have to continue to have um, you know, on our books moving forward. So it seems strange to think about what a policy would be. Um, but I do think that as representatives for our constituency, what I am hearing from folks is not really whether or not, well, yes, there's concern about money, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, okay, have them on hand. But now we've got them on hand, what are you gonna do with them? How are you gonna use them? Um, and who is going to, who's gonna make that decision? Who's gonna enforce that decision? Uh, I think that all of those things, you know, should we decide to use the masks, right? It's a lot different than using hand sanitizer. There's one way to use a hand, hand sanitizer. There's one way to use a thermometer. Um, if, if we start looking at what the requirement is for masks, I really think that this needs to come back and be a conversation. I've really had a lot of conflict over this item. Um, I've struggled with it. My poor husband will tell you it's, it's keeping me up last night. Um, and, and it really is about how they'll be used. I have a concern for the developmental appropriateness for some children, children with special needs. Um, and I know that those aren't questions that we can answer today. And as I've spoken with constituents, that's the message I told them. We, we don't have the details about how schools will open in the fall. Um, and most of them, you know, call me and they say, well, are you, are you saying that schools aren't going to open or going to open in any way other than 100% normal? Um, and I, you know, we don't have the information for that. And so I, I respect that. Um, the other piece of the puzzle that I'm hearing from a lot of folks is, is the maybe sticker shock over $300,000 on masks. Um, and I did, I did some calculations. So, you know, Ms. Bagley might have to <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks to me like we're looking at maybe like a quarter of a percent. So 0 0.02 something percent of our budget. And, um, I think for the average person looking at something that costs $300,000 and certainly for me, when I got on the board and started seeing all these zeros stack up behind, um, purchase expenses, uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but again, we've, we've talked about how much we've already spent on cleaning supplies in two months. You know, we've already spent 200, $300,000 just over the course of a couple of months, trying to make sure that our students and our buildings are healthy and safe. So, um, you know, the dollar amount sounds like a lot. Um, and then the next piece of that is, well, if we spend $300,000 to be prepared, does it become wasted? If we say, you know what, you don't have to use them. Things look really good through the summer. Dad is looking great. We don't need them. Um, is that wasted money? So I really appreciate you addressing the fact that there is room to use these items. Um, I think that there, I still have a lot of questions about what do we do with the, you know, if we use two filters and then the filters need replacing, what happens? The logistics and the practicality of what will happen next is certainly something that I think needs further discussion um, that, that I don't know that we can answer today, unfortunately, as we, as we vote on ratifying this agenda item. Um, and the last piece that I'll say, it sounds like it's kind of a moot point, is the procurement process. So as we look at reaching out and seeking vendors like this, I do hope that we will give consideration as we did for our printing and the large amount of money we spent in printing paper packets, we were able to keep those dollars local um, and support a, a local business. Um, and, and something like masks for $300,000 would be nice to be able to support one of our local businesses. Um, it sounds like Impulse already has our order in, so I'm not sure if there's opportunity to make any adjustments there, but this is the item we're voting on tonight. So um, moving forward, I think that that would be something that I would appreciate as a, as a consideration for our local um, vendors. Um, with all of that being said, uh, I, I think that I have the, the information here today and can support um, the item. And I wanna be clear again, that this is about preparedness. This is about having a foundation for pieces um, that we may need. And, and I'll reiterate that the way that they are used and the, the functional implementation of use um, is something that I certainly would like to, to come back to having a conversation about, should we have to cross that line? 
this is obviously something that the community is very passionate about. Um, and I'll end on saying, lastly, when we looked at your committees, you were sharing with us the committees of folks that are looking at how procedures will go for operations for schools. Um, if there's opportunity, I'd love to see maybe a parent stakeholder on there and a teacher stakeholder in those groups, um, because I think that they just offer a perspective that sometimes um, not everybody who's in the trenches and doing the leadership work that you guys are doing fabulously, um, I think that that is an important perspective that they can learn. So um, I appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions and I, for the end, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions before I go back to board member Joyce? Uh, board member Joyce. Yes, thank you. Through the chair to Dr. Green or Karen Chastain. Um, my question is that since this is not an approval necessarily, it's a ratification. What would be the legal ramifications if, for example, the board voted no on this item today? Through the chair to board member Joyce, I don't have the details as to the um, ordering of the mask. To I would have to rely on the district to advise whether the order can be canceled. I don't know if payment has been remitted, um, and if, if so, can those funds be reversed? Um, I would need more information from the district. Thank you. I am just a. I'm sorry. I'm just a little confused as to why you know, this item is before the board if, in fact, it has already taken place. The purchase has already been made. Through the chair to um, board member Joyce, again, it is in policy that anything that is a commodity, we would just send as a report and a commodity based on the purchasing department is something that we normally use. Also in policy is that um, I can order a purchase and remit it to the board and show that we have made this purchase and therefore more people see that we made this purchase. Even though I will say I was I questioned the uh, purchasing department, but if the director of purchasing tells me this is what I need to do, I'm more inclined to follow this is what they indicated. Um, I don't know if our purchasing director is, we, is on the line because we have a lot of people and it's hard for me to see his name, but since I don't see his name, I'm going to ask Ms. Young uh, to add further clarification. All right. Good evening. Uh, through the, the chair to uh, board member Joyce, uh, the purchasing director, Dr. Green, is not on the call. Uh, however, okay. Mr. McDuffie from, from Policy and Compliance is on the call and may want to add some additional information. Um, as Dr. Green indicated, um, we rely um, ex extensively uh, on the purchasing department to make sure that all of our purchases are properly procured. Uh, in this case, um, under the board's uh, current policy, which I believe is 7.70, uh, there is a provision that allows for the emergency uh, of certain items without a competitive solicitation. Um, when it became very clear that the national shortage uh, for protective, uh, for personal protective equipment uh, was uh, resulting in the inability of the district to procure items uh, in a timely manner. Uh, we inquired with the purchasing director as to whether or not this purchase could occur um, using that emergency criteria. Uh, and there is an analysis that has to be conducted uh, and the purchase uh, has to meet certain criteria, including whether or not there is a safety, a potential safety issue um, that could result if the items are not uh, purchased. Uh, it was the determination of the purchasing department 
um, that the purchase met those criteria for, a, for an emergency purchase. Um, the second question then was whether or not um, the purchase could, should be reported to the board under existing board policy. Uh, Dr. Green mentioned that there is a provision that allows for commodity purchases over a certain amount to be reported to the board as opposed to approved or ratified by the board. Um, because uh, as Dr. Green explained, uh, it was the opinion that this particular type of, of commodity, that, and it is a commodity, but because it is not uh, in the opinion of that office, a routine and normal commodity purchase. Uh, he did not feel that the reporting criteria was sufficient, but that rather an agenda item ratifying the purchase was necessary. And that's why the item is before you this evening. Ms. Joyce, any, uh, any other comments? Anybody else? I don't. Uh, any other hands? Um, hey, um, Ms. Grimes? Yes. Um, <clears throat> been listening to all of this, and I I understand there's a lot of emotion around the whole the whole issue, but I think that this is the kind of leadership I want. Um, even when it's hard and people may not understand, I think that we have a leader that, that does the best she can to um, make sure that we are doing the best for um, our kids and our parents. And sometimes it's, it's uh, hard, but I think it is the right thing for us to do at this time. Thank you very much. Any other hands? Seeing none. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Who by uh, Smith Juarez? Smith Juarez. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Hershey. Any more discussion? If not, I call for your vote. Vice Chair Anderson? Yes. Board Member Grimes. Yes. Board Member Hershey. Yes. Board Member Joyce. No. Board Member Smith Juarez. Yes. Board Member Willie. Yes. And Warren Jones. Yes. By your action, you approve the item six to one. Uh, we're on for the record, so we will start with Vice Chair Anderson. No travel, I forget. It just we just zoom right into for the record. Um, I would like to say I thought that the Teacher Appreciation Week was amazing. Um, it was so warming and, and heartfelt to see everybody kind of reach out and, and appreciate and value and thank a teacher. Um, that has been, that was wonderful. I, all the little tribute signs, when I take a little bike ride around my neighborhood with my son, you know, I've got a, a Creeker teacher lives here and this teacher lives here and the seniors and, um, you know, I hope that there, that there are things that we're learning about how to connect to each other in different ways that we will hold on to. Um, I love to be able to see our communities recognize, um, you know, I didn't know a teacher was there. And so I'm so grateful to know that that is somebody who is part of Team Duval, um, and, and I love that. Um, so that's been great. Um, I want to thank the Beaches Watch. I was able to have a virtual Zoom um, community meeting hosted by Beaches Watch out of the beaches. And if you haven't had an opportunity to do a virtual community meeting, it's surprisingly easy. Um, and it was a really great opportunity to to connect with folks. They did a, um, I'll say too, they did a little informal Zoom poll of the people that were participating on whether or not they would support the half cent um, referendum. And it was a 94% yes. Um, so friendly folks there, but it was really a nice opportunity to connect with 
um, constituency and, and to, to reach back out to folks um, to, for that beaches community or for district two community that that attends Fletcher High School. I just want to remind everyone that I believe their feature tribute will be on TV on June 6th. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm excited about honoring um, and respecting our seniors that have had a very bizarre graduation, very anticlimactic. Um, but this is just the, the beginning of great new adventures for all of you. So um, the superintendent, of course, had a beautiful letter that she shared um, for our seniors. I do want to thank Read USA and Ellen Witz for their donation of books. Um, I just think that it's wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to put um, books in the hands of children that might not otherwise be able to get them. And, um, you know, we work with Read USA and we work with Ellen in a variety of capacities, and I just want to make sure that that gets recognized. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge, you know, as people have called about the PPE, the cost of PPE, the cost of the sanitizer, the cost of the um, additional cleaning supplies, there are a lot of costs that we will endure um, that are exceptional to COVID. Um, and I know the board has been having conversation and we've just started discussing budgets, but I think it's really important that the community recognizes and understands that there um, is, is millions of dollars that um, that will hit our budget um, unexpectedly. We um, don't know what the impact of that will be. And so I, I just think that it's important that every step as we go through this, that we are as transparent as we can be with folks. Um, and so I think that this is an opportunity if people are you know, asking, oh my gosh, we're gonna spend $300,000 on masks, um, that there are millions of dollars being spent and just because it's not an agenda item that, that you can see online in a PDF document doesn't mean that it's not going to help make sure that our students are, are safe and healthy and well. Um, and it's, it's going to cost us money. And I certainly would like for our state leaders and our federal leaders to help support public education in providing funds, um, relief funds and stimulus funds to get us through this. Um, and, if, and if not, you know, it's going to mean a serious impact to our budget when we know that the state resources um, and our state economy is struggling as a, as a state who relies on tourism. Um, the other thing that I will say, um, I, I didn't pull the agenda item tonight. And for those of you that are familiar with the agenda, um, we, we approved several charter schools this evening. Um, and two of those were are uh, anticipated to be in District 2. It was a conversation we had at workshop and I think that it, it warrants saying again for the record that um, you know charter schools may have a place in the landscape of public education in Duval County Public Schools um, but I think it's really interesting and I want the community to be aware of where where schools are locating where they're setting up shop um, I have great schools in my district they're all high performing schools um, and, and not that we don't have amazing schools happening and, and all over Duval County. Um, but I certainly think that it's interesting and, and I would ask the families and the community members to be aware of what your options are because sometimes I think things that look shiny and new um, can be a little distracting and sometimes tried and true um, is really, you know, an important variable to consider. Um, so, I just didn't want to go without without saying that because I did struggle with some of those charter um, charter approvals. And for the folks that are saying, well, then why did you approve it? Um, you know, we keep having this conversation. I keep having this conversation. Um, and there's just pretty much no recourse. <laughs> um, you, you know, charters, it, I appreciate our school choice office. I appreciate the staff folks that we have that are knowledgeable and experts in, in what they do. But those people are, are working with you know, the charter folks to make sure that those schools are as successful as they can be. It is never our intention to let someone, um, to let any of our charter partners not be successful or to fail. Um, I would just like to see them be successful in places where they're really, really needed. Um, and coming into a neighborhood where we already have high performing schools that, um, you know, are, are thriving and not over capacity or in neighborhoods that um, have really great education options. Um, I don't know that that's the best use of resources. Um, 
I have two words of wisdom that I'd like to share tonight. I couldn't choose just one. Um, one comes from the Crane Trails Elementary kiosk that they had um, out in front of their school that I thought was just beautiful. Um, it says, we can't direct the winds, but we can adjust the sails. And in a time like this, when we certainly don't know what, what's coming on any given day, you know, we can choose how we respond. We can choose, you know, how we respond to each other, how we respond to ourselves. Um, and so I think that that's um, an important one. Um, and Malcolm X quote, when I is replaced with we, even illness becomes wellness. And I think that that is a really beautiful one to help carry us through this summer. Um, you know, that this is really about us getting together, taking care of one another. I appreciate board member Smith Juarez's comments about um, being, being helpers and having the opportunity to care for each other um, and really making sure that our children get that message and children learn things because they see us model it. So, you know, as someone who works with kids all the time, please remember that your children are watching you. They're watching what you say. They're watching how you interact with other people. And when you are caring for other people, they learn to be caring. Um, and so I, with that, um, I think I will wrap up for the night. So thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, Board Member Grimes. Um, <clears throat> I'm just, I too was very, um, uh, Inter entertained with the um, kids that, um, and I'm assuming that we're um, going to have all of the graduations in the in the uh, same time. Not really same time. Anyway, because I always I saw just one, no, two of them from our um, one. Anyway, so but doc, I think Dr. Green knows what I'm talking about as far as making sure that we are um, having all of the. Okay, say that because there was only one in the two. I guess we had, but we have some more coming on. Yes. Okay. Through the chairs. Of, yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Because it was really it was great. I mean it, it was. So they definitely will <clears throat> remember their, remember their graduation. Um, also, I appreciate um, <clears throat> uh, the um, station that is. Um, I guess it's which station it is that's helping us with this. Um, but I really appreciate what they're doing. Yeah. Before. <laughs> yeah. And then other, I saw other people too, that there were, uh, I guess they wanted to get in on it. Um, and um, I also, I, I have to um, give a shout out to um, uh, Cam and Nina, <clears throat> because every time we have these, you know, me being the, the oldest one in the, in the, and the gap, oldest one in the, uh, the, uh, did you just fall down? Um, <clears throat> um, anyway, they are really helpful of getting me set up. And I know they're getting tired of um, me trying to, you know, get the waters going on this, the stuff of uh, um, um, the, what are we doing? It's the, the <laughs> anyway. Virtual uh, meeting. Virtual meeting. But, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I really feel sorry for them because um, I am not doing it very well, but I guess I'll get better. So, thank You're you. You're doing great, Cheryl. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, Board Member Hershey. I too have enjoyed being out in my community and seeing the signs at front in all the teachers yards and all of the seniors. And I just want to applaud Principal Nicely at Mandarin High School and Principal Spaulding at Atlantic Coast for the way they distributed signs. They did it differently at uh, Atlantic Coast. They 
uh, put all the senior signs out and the seniors could come pick their sign up, which I think they some students wanted to at least drive back to campus and get them. And Mandarin High did a great job at rallying volunteers uh, to come and distribute. And again, they had, and they were taking signs as far out as Baldwin and to St. Augustine uh, from, from that class. So that was really neat. Uh, I'm excited and I appreciate the partnership uh, with, I think it's Community First Bank uh, is behind this as well as Channel 4. Um, I did see the Baldwin uh, uh, program or celebration for seniors and uh, board member Charlotte, you did a great job uh, in your in your talk uh, and words of encouragement to to your group, I noticed that you and I chose some of the same words, uh, so it was kind of funny to hear that and say I, I said something a little similar. Uh, but I think the, and the other thing I've noticed is that we've been so uh, made such a concerted effort to um, be certain that we celebrate our seniors differently. I have heard people say, "Well, when I was a senior, I didn't get a sign in my yard," or you know, so it's funny that we've started some new traditions, I think that um, when this is all said and done, that they might kind of expect it to continue on, on some level. Um, I do um, appreciate the, the books that you, uh, Read USA did donate because that is so important. Uh, and I don't think we can uh, give a shout out for that um, too much. Um, you know, it's been quite a year and we are days away from wrapping up the school year. And I just want to thank uh, the teachers and principals throughout the district and parents and students for staying the course and uh, bringing this thing in for a landing. I think we'll probably all be glad when the 2019-20 school year is over. Okay, thank you. Uh, Board Member Joyce. Thank you, uh, Chair Jones. Um, I just want to, um, for the record, say that um, when I sit down with my husband and we do our budget, uh, we are very mindful of our expenses. We're very mindful of our, our um, income and, and where our expenses go. And so we make some hard decisions. Um, we pray about a lot of purchases before we make them. Um, and I just want to say that um, when I was out in the community and I was campaigning, um, one of the things that really struck hard with me, and, and, and even as a parent and working in the school system, is that there's just a lot of concern about the school board and the budget and being able to manage that. Um, you know, I want to just say for the record that this vote tonight um, specifically approving, a, it, it might just be $300,000 and it's just not that big of a, a deal. But going back to when my husband and I do our budget, everything is a big deal because it's our money. And um, I want to acknowledge that this is taxpayer dollars and that the, the there's a lot of concern around policy and practicality and um, and policing, and that is why I had to vote no on this item tonight. Um, and, and then when you go back to last month's vote where we voted to approve principal pay and assistant principal pay and increase it by 2% on the same day you're laying off 600 plus Janet, you know, our custodial workers, these are the, I just want to be very mindful that, you know, we do have a job to do. Um, we are entrusted by our constituents to do the job. And, and I just wanted to put on the record, that is why I had to depart and vote no on this item tonight. Budget is just, financial responsibility is a really big deal, and especially going into um, a sales tax referendum. But on a happy note, um, I will say that I have enjoyed the, um, the, the shows. I've watched Daryl Willie, you did a great job, Ashley smith Forrest. I. Board Member Smith Warris, you did a great job. It's been fun to celebrate our seniors. I too have gone around and uh, seen the signs and uh, the seniors, some in my neighborhood and, and around. And so it's just been wonderful to experience this um, new way of celebrating uh, our graduating seniors. 
Um, and I just, again, as I said in, in, my, in my message to my seniors, they have demonstrated a tremendous amount of courage to get through this year and, to, and they've pressed forward to the prize. And I know that 2020, this class of 2020 has wonderful, great um, accomplishments coming in their future. And I'm proud of all of them. Thank you. All right, thank you. Did you want to mention uh, for uh, you have pulled human resource services staffing? Did you want to oh, sure. so I did. I, no, that's fine. I pulled it um, with con consent with comment because I did see on the employee transaction um, list that Ms. Folginetti, who got assistant principal of the year, is um, moving over to be the principal of Pinedale. I think it was Pinedale. And I just wanted to congratulate her. It is such an honor to have one of our employees recognized in a state competition. I know that she's worked hard and, and I, and I know as well as everyone in the district, is extremely proud of her. All right, thank you. She hasn't been selected as principal yet, but there's a process we're gonna go through. Hopefully, hopefully she'll get it, thank you. Uh, Board Member Smith Juarez. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I too wanna to take the opportunity to congratulate all of our seniors on their 13 years of incredible accomplishment. Um, they are headed out into a new and different world and I know that they're going to make their mark um, individually and collectively and just want to thank them for um, their patience and their flexibility and also uh, assure them that the lessons that they are learning now may be hard, may be frustrating, may be disappointing at times, but they will serve them well. Um, and they have made tremendous examples for how to adapt in circumstances that are out of their control. So congratulations to all of our seniors. I wish you well on uh, all of the fantastic things that lie ahead of you. Um, I also want to uh, say congratulations to our uh, Florida Assistant Principal of the Year, our uh, district um, professional of the year, uh, Redless Pearson, and, and uh, also want to recognize Tammy Talley, who we all know is an incredible athletic director, um, and now the entire state of Florida knows how incredible uh, Miss Talley is because she is Florida's athletic director of the year this year. Um, so I want to say congratulations to her. She has done tremendous work for this district for a long time and deserves every accolade uh, and, and want to say congratulations. Um, and uh, I'll just also, again, want to thank um, all of our staff, all of our teachers. I know it has been a, a, a different close to the school year. I appreciate that the state did approve the waiver, um, so we will... Uh, proceed with the end of school as originally planned, but I know that um, some of the rituals for our teachers of cleaning up their classrooms and having that post planning with their colleagues and, um, you know, really putting the period at the end of a sentence of a school year and being able to creatively look forward to the next one is a little different this year. Um, and so I, I appreciate our school based staff, our principals, our teachers, our paraprofessionals. Um, everyone who has, has really pitched in during this time also uh, being flexible with us as we work through um, how to do this in an environment that uh, we're all learning day by day. So uh, with that, I will take a personal point of privilege and say happy birthday to my husband. Um, he, is, he is being very patient about uh, the steak dinner that I cook him once a year. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will leave it there. <laughs> you didn't think about the dinner, huh? <laughs> okay, uh, board member Willie. Yeah, and I'll, I'll do this fast so you can get to that birthday steak. I like that. Uh, I just want to, first of all, there has been a number of, of ACE meetings in a number of my schools in my area. They've all ended. I just want to thank all the folks who participated in those. Some really robust conversations. 
And I know this board will have some more addition, additional workshop time to talk through uh, some of those ACE processes, but I wanted to make sure that I shouted those folks out because there was folks all across uh, District 4 and 5 that were participating in those and spent a lot of time and energy. So I appreciate everybody there. Um, do want to shout out once again, uh, Tammy Talley. I'm an athlete, so I know all about athletics. Um, and she's just an amazing person. So congratulations to her on being the winner of the uh, athletic director for the state. And as well as Kate, Kate Fulginetti, I've worked with her for years now. And just to see her name up there and uh, Dr. Green is so right. She's so humble. She will never take all the credit herself. And that's what great leaders do. Um, and she is that. So I'm just so proud of her. So proud of what she's done at Matthew Gilbert under Principal Goodwin. And I just, it's amazing to see her and now get to plant seeds in other places, hopefully at Pinedale. Uh, Dr. Green says she has a crystal ball. I don't know who else would control that crystal ball. I guess Dr. Green does, but so congrats to Kate. Um, it was really great to see the 40 year plus teachers. I was actually born in 79. So to think that these folks were, I was coming out of the womb, they're walking into the classroom. That's quite like, that's amazing to me. So just uh, amazing work. Congratulations to all the folks and hope you stay another 20 years or 40 years, uh, which would be uh, almost impossible, but awesome. Um, also, Read USA, thank you. I'm a, a dad who has a, a kindergartner who reads every day, and we're running out of books. Like, we're trying to figure out where, where to get more books. So the fact that, that, that Read USA and Ellen are providing these books to these, these, all these kids, I just can't commend that enough. And lastly, but not least, uh, our amazing teachers who are closing out the year and who are teaching our seniors, our seniors who are finishing out a tremendous, really odd year. But thank you to Channel 4, uh, Community First, for hopping in to really celebrate them. And we just look forward to what you're going to do to change the world. So congrats, seniors, and everybody stay safe out there. Chair Jones, can I add one more thing really quickly? Okay. All right. Vice Chair Thank you so much. Just really quickly, um, I wanted to say thank you to Councilman Freeman, Council, um, Councilman Diamond, Councilman Bowman. Um, they are working together with myself to provide a food distribution for the Mayport community. That's going to be on May 30th. Um, that's a Saturday at 9 a.m. at Mayport Elementary School. Um, so I really appreciate those efforts um, coming, coming forward from the council and their partnership. And I wanted to let the community know that that will be available for them May 30th. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a few items. I just want to also congratulate the 2020 graduating class. I think they have wonderful memories because of what the principals and, and so many people are doing from Channel 4 uh, and so many others who, who are making these memories different. They're not proms, they're not grad bash, but they will have memories that will last a lifetime. And I think uh, we need to, we need to uh, celebrate that. They've done an outstanding job, and, and in spite of the conditions that they've had to endure this last three or four months, I think uh, they will go on to do great things for our community and this nation and this country. Um, Ms. Talley, congratulations. Uh, she's been uh, a longtime employee of this district and done an outstanding job, and I'm glad now this entire state knows the kind of work that she's done, uh, not just... Uh, for one or two schools, but the entire school district. And for the teachers who are closing out the school year and those wonderful teachers who've worked here for more than 40 years, uh, we can't say enough about what you've done for this district and what you're still doing for this district. And we thank you all. Uh, hope you work many, many more years. Uh, it's a wonderful prof profession. And I think uh, you're an inspiration to others who uh, as Mrs. Joyce has done for a number of years. Maybe she'll go back to the classroom one day, but we thank them for all the work they've done these many 40 plus years. Um, and also for the principals who celebrated doing Teacher Appreciation Week. I know Mr. Hall gave out lunches to all of his teachers. They came by, they drove, it was a drive-by lunch giveaway. And I just want to thank him for recognizing the outstanding work that our teachers do each and every day. Uh, and I think that completes my comments. Anything else? Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by board member Willie, second by Vice Chair Anderson for adjournment. Anything else? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Hearing none, meetings adjourned.
Thank you. Have a great summer.